Hi, I'm Amanda. And I'm Jacob. And we are Team MyFlow. We've developed the world's first tampon monitor to let menstruators know the saturation level of their tampon in real time to prevent anxiety, leakage, staining, risk of infection, shame, stigma. Um, so we're going to talk about something today that most people don't ever even think about, um, the period. But first, I want to make sure it's relevant to you. So how many of you have met a woman? Amazing. So this will be somewhat relevant. Cool. Um, so we're going to go through our journey about um, innovating in women's health, which we've seen a huge dearth of generally throughout history until recently. More specifically, we will talk about the shattering of the uterus, I mean awkwardness lining, because there's just a lot of stigma around this and why is it, why is that? What has menstrual innovation looked like throughout history? Um, how can tech help? Is it even relevant? What my flow is and what challenges do we face? So first let's ask, why is this something that we even thought of? Last year I was texting someone, just had to tell them that it was that time of the month. I have my period and I need to change my tampon. I got tampon misspelled and autocorrect did not know that that was a word that they needed to suggest to me. However, I am playing a sport and need to adjust my jock strap, something that not a lot of males even use, first and only suggestion. So this is something that you know we don't really talk about a lot. Um, not to mention that it's known in most cultures as the curse for a lot of reasons, from frustration to constant leakage and staining, sexual stigma and thought of as impurity, physical pain, and infection that can be actually fatal. So let me talk about briefly what it's looked like throughout history. Um, in the early days, women were banished to a tent uh, on the outskirts of town and deemed as non-functioning members of society during this week. A little later in history, they decided that, okay, you can function, but you know, awkwardly and non-ergonomically appropriately. Then the pad came to be and uh, with, it, with its adhesive lining and various types of um, shape and, and absorbent material, it allowed women more functionality. But it wasn't until 1929 that people thought, well, why don't we just you know, go to the source directly and like, not let it even leave the body? And the tampon, which is French for buffer, was invented and commercialized. It went a little too far, however, in um, the 70s and 80s when Tampax came out with a product called Rely. It, um, women, they were addressing the pain point that you know women were not comfortable with taking out tampons that were not saturated enough. It's uncomfortable. So they um, came up with one that is extra absorbent and stayed in for days. That, however, harbored great breeding ground for bacterial infection, um, and a lot of women ended up receiving amputations from spread infections and also a lot ended up dying. So now every tampon box sold in the US has a warning on it that says you can only leave them in for eight hours to you know, not harbor this infection potential. And then the last uh, potential thing that women can use during their periods is a menstrual cup, which is a suction cup that adheres to the walls of the vagina. And um, it's a very niche product, specifically geographically. In the US, 70% of us use the tampon as at least part of our menstrual solution each month. Um, whether it's applicator or not, most of us use applicators. However, in the other parts of the world where it is relevant and used, um, most women do not use applicators. Even more ubiquitously, the pad is actually something that most of the world uses. When we were prototyping in China for the earlier this year, we couldn't even find any tampons anywhere in China. Um, and this is for religious and traditional reasons because a lot of people don't believe that there should be anything inside the vagina prior to marriage. Um, and then as we discussed before, the cup is very niche both here on the west coast of the US and in the UK. But last year, 2015, was deemed the year of the period by NPR because of some pretty exciting things that are finally coming to be. Um, some that are notable are uh, 
a man in, in rural India who was sick of his wife having to use rags every month, so actually made his own tampon, uh, I'm sorry, pad factory, and there's a documentary about him called Menstrual Man, to sustainable cloth solutions, to monthly gift packages and art, to a tampon that plays music to your baby when it's a fetus, um, to some pretty, uh, Similar things to ours, such as Thinks, which are absorbent underwear to prevent leakage, and B-Sense, a pad, and Next Gen Jane, a tampon, that um, both have the idea of collecting the menstrual fluid in lieu of having to go get a blood test, because that's like wasted data right there. And then Loom Cup has a, had a Kickstarter last year for their smart menstrual cup. In short, um, this was the cover of Newsweek this April. There will be blood, get over it, um, because people are just <laughs> ready for this phenomenon that affects half the world for half of our lives to finally be addressed. So where do we fit into this? Who are we? Well, we are MyFlow. What do we make? What is MyFlow? MyFlow comes in three parts. There is a smartphone app, works on your iOS or Android device. There are our modified tampons, which attach to the tampon monitor. Now, how do these work? Well, I have a really great instructional video for you all. OK. So this is our tampon monitor. To use it, you would simply insert the tampon as normal. You clip the monitor onto your waistband or underwear and it will light up to signify that it is uh, connected successfully with the tampon. Then it will start transmitting data to, our phone, to the phone, where you can then set notifications so your phone can tell you, oh, you're at 25, 50, 80 percent, whatever you want to set it to. And that's not all it does. You can't just see moment to moment. You can also look at the long-term trends of your data. So you can look at your average. You can look at your current uh, monthly flow. And when you're not using it, it stores on this keychain so you can keep it around until you next need it. Our app also has some pretty cool features that I want to tell you about. So it actually learns your flow. Um, it uses machine learning to be able to predict a lot of things. So first of all, it can predict time until removal, which we've found is a really big pain point, as Amanda was saying earlier, with our customers. You know, if you're walking into a movie, you can be like, oh, check your phone. Oh my god, three hours left. I can sit through Inception. That's fine. Or like, oh, an hour and a half. I don't want to walk out in the middle of the great hallway spinny fight scene. I should just go now and change it. You can also predict the, uh, the timing of your cycle. There are a lot of apps right now that do this. There's Guess, there's Clue, there's a lot more that I'm not going to mention all of them. But there was a time where to log your fitness data, you would go onto your phone and you would write in, OK, uh, I did um, 30 minutes of moderate exercise. And you would say, oh, this is how many calories you burned. But you know, it's 2016. We have Fitbits now. We, we don't need to manually type in all this data ourselves like a, a data monkey. So we figure it's time that we give the period the same treatment. And what this will result in is an awesome database of menstrual information. So 82% of our potential customers have said that they would uh, want to have their data aggregated anonymously so it could be used to spur innovation in the sector and in biotech in general. So when we um, came out to the public as something that is a thing in May, um, the press kind of exploded with excitement about the ability to know when your tampon's full because you usually can't see or feel it. Um, and this was worldwide with some mixed results. Um, everyone had something to say. My personal favorite title was Gizmodo's This Bluetooth Tampon is the Smartest Thing You Can Put in Your Vagina. <laughs> there was actually a comment on that article from a gentleman that said, well, that's because you don't know my IQ. <laughs> I don't think that comment's still there. Um, but as it's you know a pretty controversial and not really mentioned space, we had mixed results. Wall Street Journal said the internet of every single thing must be stopped. We had some good stuff. The New York Times said, just how smart do you want your blender to be? And we were in there as something that might not be necessary. Um, but 
going into that first article more specifically, um, the author mentions that, you know, maybe she's never been more wrong. Maybe these connected products push ahead human progress and innovation. She then goes on to potentially compare us to, you know, the invention of electricity. That, that was pretty freaky when, you know, there was a lightning coming down onto a key from a kite. <laughs> and people were really scared of that being in consumer products. But potentially women's health is experiencing that revolution right now, and we're in, in kind, very scared, and maybe it'll become, like Jacob mentioned, just like another track phenomenon like sleep. So there's a why here. There's a, a reason why we're doing this. We've talked about how, and we've talked about what's happened. But you know, the, the question that a lot of people have is, you know, why is this even important? And I want to address that. Um, so yes, we are cre creating, at the end of the day, a consumer product. It's a thing you go and you buy and then you have it and the store has money. Great. But what we're also doing is creating data. Now what does data do? It illuminates problems that we don't know about. It brings things into the light from the darkness. And I want to talk a little bit about what being in the darkness has meant for menstruation. So medically, right now, the most rigorous way of measuring a woman's or anybody's menstrual flow is to have them use a pad, and then when they're done with it, you take it and you weigh it and you say, okay, it's, you know, it's about you know, 30 milliliters of blood, I guess, that they, they menstruated. And there's no way of knowing, oh, were they heavy at the beginning and they taper it off at the end. There's no way of being able to really get fine information out of this data, and that's the most rigorous it gets. Below that, there's literally just taking the pad, and this is a real method, looking at it and saying, yeah, 30 milliliters, probably. And this is, you know, we sleep for 33% of our lives, right? Menstruators menstruate on average for 6.5% of their lives. And yet the, the amount of data we have on sleep is orders of magnitude greater than the amount we have on menstruation. This is, as Amanda said, it's something that affects half of the population in the world for half their lives. And it's really pretty ridiculous that considering uh, hysterectomies, IUDs, birth control pills, all these procedures, devices, and drugs that affect menstruation, we don't have any way of quantifying how they do that. So that's something we'd like to address. Innovation. Right now, at least until last year, there's not a lot of innovation in this sector. And it's partly because of the stigma against menstruation. And it's partly because there's not a lot of data around it. And really, it's hard to separate the two. That's another thing we want to impact. So we want to create data that allows people to go into this sector and, and create things themselves. We want to make this more accessible. And lastly, and most importantly, we want to address stigma. Because that's kind of at the root of all of this. Because it's my personal belief that, OK, I have on my phone right here, for like every night I've slept for the past couple of years, how long I've slept, and what the quality of sleep was. I have similar data for the number of steps I've taken. And a lot of people do. And once we can say the same thing about menstruation, what, it can be another app that you put on your phone, and it's sitting there right next to all your other bodily functions. Maybe people will be able to, to start to realize, eh, this isn't some like disgusting, horrible thing that we have to like erase from the public conscious, besides to, like make weird jokes about it in movies. Maybe this is just another normal biological phenomenon. We can start to accept it like that. And really, this gets to a deeper issue of that there are things we know, and there are things we know that we don't know. But the most dangerous are the things we don't know we don't know, the unknown unknowns. And as much as I am gung-ho about menstrual innovation now, a year ago, before I started working here, on a day-to-day -day basis, I didn't know that menstruation even existed. It didn't cross my mind at all. So there's this problem where we have, you know, known things, and then outside, it's, ah, menstruation's over there. And there are a lot of benefits to bring this into the, the realm of what is known. And yeah, there's stuff like I was just talking about. There's bringing people in, making them feel included, having everybody's problems out on the table, or not problems, having everybody's uh, experiences out on the table so we can all share in them. But there's also a lot more. I mean, we're all hackers, right? We're all here because we like to build really cool things. I've done, uh, I've worked on a 
pretty nice array of stuff. And the work I've been doing this past year has been some of the most interesting I've ever done. Like working with the human body, dissecting what's okay and what's not to do in terms of FDA regulations and safety, working with this specific phenomenon, it's been really interesting. And putting this into the, the space of not unknown unknowns allows us all to share in that and all to, to solve these really interesting problems. Not only that, but in a space that's neglected, there is huge opportunity for a smart entrepreneur to come along and create a device and make a lot of money by improving the quality of life of a lot of people. So whatever your, your reason is for wanting to do it, there's plenty to be found there. And the really interesting thing is that once you merge these two, you know, you say, okay, great, menstruation is part of the known space now. The question that you then have to ask is what other unknown unknowns are out there? What other spaces are just waiting to be opened up so we can, we can start to explore them and start to see what problems they present and start to capitalize on audiences that want help? Well, for those spaces, as well as for menstruation, it's about bloody time. Thank you.